you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and welcome to our our uh, Wellness Matters speaker series on physician wellness. Um, the Physician Wellness Advisory Committee is very pleased to welcome Dr. Mel Lewis uh, to uh, to talk to us today about renovating toxic culture in our culture. Mel is uh, Dr. Lewis is a pediatrician from the University of Alberta. And she serves as the chief wellness officer for the University of Alberta, uh, University of Alberta. From what I know, she's the only chief well, she's the only person that has a chief wellness officer her role called thus in Canada. Um, and we are all very envious of that. Also with their many billions of dollars that they just don't know what to do with in their province. We're also envious of that. <laughs> But Melanie, uh, Mel Lewis has served um, in many roles, both as, uh, as um, before the chief, her chief wellness officer role. She was um, the vice dean of learners in the faculty of medicine at University of Alberta, or associate dean, sorry, in the office of advocacy and well-being. Um, as I said, she's a professor of pediatrics, a consultant pediatrician at Stollery, and cares about inpatient and outpatient. Uh, she's also very well versed in the area of wellness, and um, we are very anxious to hear how, what she, what words of wisdom she has for us today. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Mel, and I'll let you take it away. Uh, fantastic. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. Uh, Queen's is a mecca of physician health led by yourself, Melanie, and Leslie Flynn, and your learner affairs group. So it's a huge honor to be asked to speak at this. Um, if you were hoping for a talk on mindfulness and personal resilience, uh, I'm not the droid that you're looking for. Uh, this talk will be talking mostly about the structural and systemic issues that are eroding our health and healthcare. And so hence, uh, the, the title, Renovating Toxic Culture. Uh, the first thing that I would love to do is to try and get rid of all of this psychology of postponement stuff that we live in in medicine. I think it's ironic because as physicians, we know that life can change on a dime and we know that it's very finite. And yet for many of us, this is our life because of what we are currently enduring. And it goes like this. So, uh, well, after I get into med school and I get through undergrad, oh, my, my life's going to be better. I'll have a life then. Oh, well, no, wait, there's this CARMS thing. So uh, when I get a residency position, you know, that residency position I want in the city I want, oh my gosh, life will be so much better. I'll spend time with my friends and my family and have time for myself. And be, oh, wait, wait, there's a licensing exam. Oh, okay. So uh, as soon as I get that licensing exam and that grand rounds and all of that other stuff done, life's totally going to be better then. It's, it's totally going to be better. Oh, wait, uh, I'm, I'm new staff. I feel totally incompetent and I'm like wearing the fraud complex. Okay, maybe just a few years under my belt, life's gonna get better for sure. Oh, now I have young children and I'm super tired. Uh, so like maybe when my kids are older, uh, life will be better. Oh, 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 wait, I have to make tenure. It's like six years. I need these grants and this medical education stuff and, and, I, and I need to publish, wait. Oh, okay. Well, once I can start saying no to my Dean, uh, life's definitely going to get better. And then, you know, when I retire, uh, life will be better. Okay. This is totally pathetic. This is totally us. Uh, I'm a huge fangirl of Tate Shanafelt's work, which many people in this audience are as well. So when he did a study of his oncology colleagues, he found out that 37% of them were looking forward to retirement as an important wellness strategy. Uh, we have to get over this. So we're going to talk uh, today, oops, sorry, uh, the objectives today, because I'm a geeky medical educator, uh, are to define the health uh, promoting learning and work environments, to illuminate the barriers to meaningful change in academic and clinical environments, to discuss the systemic and structural drivers and the deterrence of a healthy organization, and review some real tangible interventions to change the health outcomes for ourselves and our colleagues. And for people who know me who are in this audience, I can be pretty cynical. So the fact that I think we can change this in my lifetime as a physician uh, says something. So let's talk a bit about the fertilizer. So first of all, community. We have awesome colleagues. Uh, we support each other. We get what we're coping with. We mop each other's fears, or fears, fears and tears. Uh, 
equity, inclusivity, and anti-racism important? Not quite there where we need to be. Uh, respect and professionalism, also amazing fertilizer. Again, in some places we have a ways to go. Um, really important is that our contributions are recognized by the organization and by our leadership and that we feel valued. Um, and help promoting policy. And that's at all levels. It's having a equitable, flexible call schedule to having fair promotion policy, to having good leave policies. All those pieces are super important and we need skilled leadership to, to support us and to support our environments. And so what are the pests? I love this picture. Uh, the biggest pest from my perspective is a lack of psychological safety. And of course, in medicine, we love hierarchy. And that puts a lot of folks in unsafe positions and with real concerns of retribution to their potential career options. Um, and of course, this hierarchy and psychological safety leads to racism, discrimination, mistreatment. Of course, there's that hidden curriculum. We say this, but we do something totally different. Uh, our workload, uh, we're just coming through COVID. Our workload was crazy before, and then it just got crazier. Um, and it's the administrative tasks. That is the thing that really erodes us. It's the inefficiencies in our workflow, our inability to get the things we need for our patients. It's, the, it's our inboxes that are like overflowing and passive leadership. Passive leadership who does not attend to the toxic places and toxic people in our environment. So how did we get here? And how do we get to this culture and this state of uh, not being a very well group? Was it a matter of seed selection? Is it because we just select our highly anxious, perfectionistic OCD folks that, you know, then their health just continues to erode in medicine? Turns out that is absolutely not true. And it's been shown in multiple studies. Uh, Brazo did this one in 2014 and clearly showed that matriculating medical students coming through our doors on that first day have lower rates of burnout and depression and higher quality of living, uh, quality of life scores compared to their age match peers across all the other faculties. So we start healthier, healthier than our peers, and then something happens through training that's not so awesome. So there's study after study that shows the state of health of our residents, um, whom we're very concerned for. This meta-analysis showed that between 20 and 40% uh, of our residents, depending on what instrument they used, are depressed. And then uh, back in 2018, the CMA did their National Physician Health uh, Survey. And I just want you to look at the last four items that are appalling. Uh, so 40% of our residents were burnt out and a third of physicians. 50% uh, of our residents were depressed and a third of our physicians. Um, and then, of course, they repeated this uh, back in 2021 in the heart of COVID. So shocker, things weren't better. So when they redid the data in 2021, and it was just released last summer, one in two physicians screened positive for depression. The burnout rates near doubled. But the one that caught my eye for recent suicidal ideation in the last 12 months one in five residents, one in five of our residents were contemplating suicide during COVID. And that number is astounding. I know uh, in my lifetime, I've had six people who are pretty close to me who have completed suicide. Uh, four of them were residents at the time and, and folks that I uh, had taught uh, at some point in my career. Uh, a program director at U of A committed suicide, and I've had a couple of colleagues. So I think all of us have this experience, and we've just become numb to it. It's just become normalized in our profession, and we don't realize how much of an outlier we actually are. In the United States, there are 400 physicians who die by suicide each year. That's a little over one a day. And suicide is the only cause of morbidity that's higher in physicians than in non-physicians. And I think there's a good reason for that because we are smart people. So if we want to avoid coronary artery disease or type two diabetes, we, we know what to do. We know how to care for ourselves. But I think there's so many factors outside of our control to stay well, that this is why these statistics persist. So let's look at burnout. This is a, a famous uh, study that was done by Schoenfeld back in 2012. And it showed at best, 30% of us are burnt out, and at worst, 65% are burnt out. And uh, emergency medicine is the worst. 
And the, the folks who tend to have the most undifferentiated patient populations, the ones who are working on the front lines, tend to be doing the worst. And I giggled because in this study, it says that PHPM were the best. I feel that Dina Hinshaw, the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Alberta, would not agree with that uh, anymore if we repeated this study. So the one really important thing to know, and many of you know this, is that burnout is not a diagnosis. It is an occupational phenomena. And Christina Maslach is so upset of how misused her burnout inventory has, has been employed because it was never supposed to measure the person. It was always supposed to measure the environment and the toxic toxicities that we face. So our interventions were supposed to be at the environment and not at the person, but it's been really misused and misinterpreted. So what are the stressors that lead to burnout? So for learners, there's curriculum uh, I know that's not a real word, but you know what I mean, right? So uh, we keep adding amazing things into our curriculum. Uh, indigenous health, LGBT health, uh, point of care ultrasound, uh, social justice, uh, social accountability, all these things that absolutely need to be there, but we're not taking out cardiology block and we're not taken out of anatomy. We're just getting more and more clever as medical educators to just pack it in and see what our, our learners can cope with. And then of course our learners are underpowered and this leads to mistreatment and a lack of psychological safety. Um, residency positions, oh my gosh, you wanna be an anesthetist like uh, Melanie Yeager? 50-50 shot in CARMS that you're gonna get that. And who knows where in the country you might get it if you're one of the lucky 50%. Um, it is uh, super stressful. And then if the CARMS gods got it wrong, and you land in the wrong place in the wrong specialty, good luck trying to transfer because that is uh, an arduous course. And then of course, um, our underrepresented students face uh, specific uh, stressors. I think we're doing a much better job of having a much more diverse um, medical student uh, pool, but I feel that we do not have uh, the supports on the other side to make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, CBME has added huge stressors, both for faculty and learners, and the administrative tasks have been overwhelming. And then service to education ratio has been there since the dawn of time. Typically, uh, in the old days and continues now, uh, if there's just more clinical demands, we just load more on our residents, more call, bigger teams, and that type of thing. In terms of staff, we were totally set up in medical school. We were kind of told that we could do it all. We could be excellent uh, spouses. We could be excellent parents. We could be excellent uh, doctors. We could be excellent researchers. We could be excellent medical educators. All these pieces, it's, it's not possible. Nobody told me that being good enough was gonna be okay. So trying to juggle these competing roles is a huge stressor for us. Uh, and of course, there's this lack of training and leadership and conflict. I proposed at U of A, didn't go over very well, especially amongst my cardiology colleagues, that we just get rid of cardiology block. I mean, come on, it's four chambers, blood goes in, blood goes out, like how hard is it? But the thing that makes me want to be a barista at Starbucks is difficult personalities. It's navigating politics. It is trying to influence agendas. I needed that training in medical school. And then maybe I wouldn't think that those baristas have the best job ever at Starbucks. The other issue for us is that we take on things onto our plates that we cannot cope with. And when we're overflowing and you're the director of three different things, you can't see the alternative to your current circumstance. You don't realize you can say no, or you can say this is too much. We think, well, then who's going to do it? No one can do it as, as well as we can. And we just can't see it. And then EMR, that is a whole hour and a half talk by itself, but you all know what that stressor is and perfectionism. Um, I've really been digging into this lately. It is uh, a huge toxicity to our environments uh, and to us as people because many of us have this trait and it's a problem. So I see it in some learning environments um, and maybe you've met this person. This person is the most amazing clinician. They are esteemed in their field. They know every journal article. They can quote the p-value of the bedside maneuver. They are amazing. They go above and beyond for their patients, but they are brutal to their learners because they've had these perfectionistic standards for themselves. So, you know, they're amazing clinicians now, but they have those same expectations for their learners. And they're so harsh and so cutting, they just take them out at the, out at the knees. Maybe that's you know just in my experience, but I think that person hangs around in a lot of universities. 
And then the other problem for us personally with perfectionism is it keeps you stuck. So there's no delegation because nobody can do it as well as I can. So I'm not going to ask for help. I procrastinate because if I can't do it perfect, I'm not going to do it at all. Uh, I'm indecisive because I got to make the best choice. And so that's hard. I'm conflict avoided because that's just messy. Um, I'm living with this imposter syndrome, which we talk about a ton with learners. And there's one in five of us who are staff people who are still imbued with this syndrome. And then rumination. Uh, and, and see if you see yourself. It's just like you're ruminating about that email you sent or how you worded it. You're ruminating about that conversation you had with your dean in the hall. You're ruminating about, you know, this presentation that you gave that didn't go as well as you hoped it would. And then in the back of that rumination piece is this negative highlight reel that we all carry with us. We remember every mistake we made. We remember every time we didn't get to that diagnosis immediately. We just play this negative stuff again and again. We don't remember like the time we made that awesome diagnosis or that time I gave that kick-ass lecture. We just remember the negative stuff. And then the other problem with perfectionism is this overworking thing. So we're people pleasing. We want to be all things to everybody because, you know, there's no limit to our abilities. And so then you just get overwhelmed with work. We start bulldozing conversations because, again, you, you just have to finish them quickly because then, you know, it's less messy. And then, you know, you're multitasking because you think you can do that, which none of us can really. You become a workaholic. You have no work-life balance. And what are these things called boundaries? So I think from the first day of medical school, we have to remind people that perfectionism is evil and the goal is excellence and not perfectionism. It's not possible. So this leads me directly into this issue that we don't really talk about. I feel like the gulf between staff and residents is growing. And I know where I work and uh, around other places that I've seen, there is open animosity sometimes between the faculty and the learners. And I've thought a lot about that. And I think part of it is like when I grew up in medicine, we were supposed to, it was a calling. We were supposed to abrogate our life to medicine. And if we didn't do that, and if it wasn't all consuming, we just you know weren't committed enough. Uh, and now we've got this new generation coming up where we've been talking about physician health. We've been talking about boundaries. We've been talking about calling in and calling out microaggressions and a group that's like way more EDI aware. And so we've got this group coming up that like maybe isn't going to adhere to the status quo. So, you know, when somebody says you have to do more call because it's COVID and they're like, no, that's actually against our contract. We're not going to do that. There's a little bit of silence because in our day, we just put our head and did it. It wasn't healthy. It wasn't right. All of those things. But that was the culture that we came from. So I think there's a lot of faculty members who are still there and we're waiting to reap the rewards of being faculty. But now there's, you know, this, this more shared expectation of how we're going to manage patient care. And it's not going to be done the way we used to do it. And, you know, with these much more EDI aware uh, learners who, thank goodness, I had my job in the Office of Advocacy and Wellbeing because they taught me so much and made me a better human and called me out all the time, because trust me, I make lots of mistakes. But then if you call out a faculty member of the way they phrased something in a lecture or they said something that was totally a microaggression, our veneers are so thin right now because we are working so hard and so stretched that you 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 react in a, in a defensive way. It's like, fine, I'm not going to teach again. And then it, it just festers, I think, this, this chasm that sometimes can grow between the learners and the faculty. And I just think it's really important that we talk about it because I think it's there. Um, there's not a lot of literature around it, but um, you know, having community at work is everything and having that, that collegiality. So I just really think we, we need to think about that. So this leads, of course, directly into psychological safety. Um, I'm a big fan of Amy Edmondson. She's kind of the business leader who led uh, this conversation about psychological safety. So her definition was, um, you have psychological safety if you're comfortable expressing and being yourself. Um, when people have psychological safety, they feel comfortable sharing concerns and bringing up their mistakes without fear of embarrassment, belittlement, or retribution. And they're confident they, they can speak up and won't be humiliated, ignored, or blamed. Um, I've been working with a few areas uh, in my neighborhood recently, and I found out like there's like some surgeons, for instance, who won't talk to their learners throughout the entire case. They'll talk to the nurses and they'll talk to the anesthetists and they'll, but just just silence. It's um, it's shocking, really. 
Um, and it's a workplace that calls out and calls in microaggressions. We can all learn, like we expect feedback and psychologically safe environments aren't like nice environments. It's not like we're gonna be hugging and holding hands. It's about honesty and this whole concept about radical candor to make sure that like we, we are safe to bring the concerns to the forefront and, and work them out and work them through. Um, Amy Emmonson uh, during her doctoral studies did this super cool study. So she's not from healthcare, but uh, she looked at healthcare teams and she went in and she measured the healthcare teams using all these quantitative and qualitative measures. And so she identified which ones were high functioning, which ones were less functioning. And then her hypothesis was that the high functioning teams would have less medical errors. Seems fair. So when she dug into her data, she found out the opposite was true. So these really high functioning teams reported more errors. So she was like, okay, this isn't really helpful for my doctoral dissertation. So she sent her researchers back and she dug into what was going on. And this is how she discovered psychological safety as a concept, because she found that the, the group that was reporting more errors, they had psychological safety. They were totally dug in to say, what's going on in our area? What needs to be improved? That's not okay. That person's not okay. And they talked about it. The other group they just didn't report their errors. They were just going to leave their dead bodies buried deep, deep below the surface. Everybody knew there were problems, but nobody felt safe to bring them up. So it's super huge. It's huge when, you know, you've had your head taken off because you you, you phoned a staff person. So you're not going to phone them again when you have a concern about a patient. If, if you're a nursing colleague and, and somebody's taken your head off on the phone before, you're, you're not going to call because you, you have a worry about a patient or you're wondering about a drug dose. So... All of the big hitters in business, like Wharton and MIT, Harvard, uh, they have soon recognized that if you're going to have a, a very high functioning organization, you need two things. You need high standards and you need psychological safety. Psychological safety is not nice to have. It's a, it's a must have. And so this is um, what happens. So if you have low psychological safety and low standards, low expectations, that's the apathy zone. You can just show up for work. It's fine. Uh, and then if you have high standards and low psychological safety, this is uh, this is the anxiety zone. This is just when you live in fear of, of somebody yelling at you or you're so fearful of making a mistake because it is not safe to do so. And then if you have high psychological safety and low standards, well, that's pretty comfy. But if you have high standards and high psychological safety, that's the learning and high performance zone. That is where we all want to be in all sorts of businesses, but I would say it applies to healthcare. Um, specifically. So talking about psychological safety, um, I've also been thinking a lot about um, what happened to us uh, in, in medicine when we started and be, to preserve our identity and to be able to be ourselves. Uh, there was a really hard conversation at CCME last year. Uh, one of the Indigenous learners uh, talked about that there were parts of medical school that were like residential school. And it was about, you know, stripping of identity once you got there. And, and, and we all kind of conformed to this image of the, the colonial good, good doctor, didn't we, along the way? Uh, I think uh, our underrepresented uh, learners are most at risk. So our Black medical students, our Indigenous medical students. But, like, it happened to all of us. I want to write a paper called, like, Lost Limbs, like all the pieces that we lost of ourselves as we went through medical training. But, but you see it, and you remember back to your class. You started med school, and you had these super cool people who had super crazy hair, might have been different colors. They might have had cool length. They might have had piercings, all of these things. And then you go into clerkship. It all dissolved, right? You started your audition. You had to conform. You had to be what people wanted you to be. And then we just kind of continued on. There was this really cool study by uh, Schiffer Ginsburg and Billick, I think, out of Toronto, looking at internal medicine residents, specifically the female uh, internal medicine residents. And they got different feedback than their, their male colleagues, which was super interesting. But when they dug into it, they found like the, the female residents kind of tried to intentionally become more masculine. Like more likely to wear a white coat so that they would be taken seriously and and known to be the doctor on the team, uh, more likely to wear to, to be taken seriously if they wore pants versus, you know, a skirt and heels, uh, the way they spoke, uh, the way they they held themselves. So, again, we, we all had these conforming features that 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 stripped away like who we are and those really cool pieces of our personality, which I hope is why the medical schools wanted us in the first place. So it's, it's this whole thing about, you know, fear drives this impression management, fear of, of not getting the job, fear of not being a team player, fear of sticking out, all of those pieces. 
And for all the learners uh, that I've taught that might be in this Zoom room, uh, I'm super embarrassed in the fact that when I was doing lots of career counseling, I would say, you know what? You just need to shadow. Shadow and see where you fit. Shadow and see where you fit. That was terrible advice. I mean, you, you can contribute having a completely different lens and viewpoint and way of being than, than the group that you're hanging out with. And, and you could have been amazing in that area. But I think that's pretty common advice. So we have spent a, a lot of time and effort breaking down barriers and attracting diverse and underrepresented medical students. But I am super worried that we have not built the necessary supports for all of our students to maintain their identity and well-being once they hit medical school and residency and beyond. So it's easy, right? So let's get to the like the more optimistic part about like how we're going to actually deal with this because uh, it's complicated, right? So uh, more mindfulness, mm, yeah, no. Um, if it were only that easy, right? To me, it's like weight loss. So um, for weight loss, 10% uh, of it's exercise. Exercise is super important. It's like good for your mental health. It's good for your body. All of that stuff, it's important. But 90% of it is how many calories go in your mouth. So I feel physician health is the same paradigm. So 10% is those personal resilience strategies, mindfulness, making sure you, you, you manage your fatigue, you, you exercise. All those pieces are important, but they're about 10% important, 90% is the actual structural and systemic environmental hazards around us that, that we need to pay attention to because that's the thing that's really going to change our culture and our well-being. Uh, the analogy I gave, I, I gave a talk at ICRE and uh, I love Formula One. I know it seems kind of weird. And I'm a, I have a massive crush on uh, Lewis Hamilton. And so uh, this is my analogy. So Lewis Hamilton is the best race car driver of all time. Like when I used to watch F1 years ago, it was almost boring. He won all the races. Like he's the most winningest guy of all time, except for last year. Last year, he didn't win a single race, not one race. So what happened? He still had his personal trainer. He still had his physio. He still had his dietitian. He still had his sports psychologist. He was resilient. He is doing all the things he possibly can, and he is losing. And why is he losing? He's in a terrible car. Mercedes gave him a terrible car. It porpoised up and down. It was like causing micro fractures in his neck. And so what did Lewis Hamilton did? He did more exercises to like fix his neck. I wanted to like scream at him in the, in, in, when I was watching F1 saying, it's not about you. It's, it's about your car. It's, it's about what's around you. And I think that that's a really good analogy for us as doctors, because it's what's around us. We are super resilient. We are doing all the things that we need to do, but it's not enough. So I love this phrase by Muna Abdi. Instead of praising people for being resilient, change the systems that are making them vulnerable. Love it. So this was an awesome paper, again, by Tate Shanafelt. And this goes through the era of being a, a physician. So and this is my lifetime. So the era of distress that he describes happened before 2005. This is like when we were gods. We didn't need to sleep. We didn't need to eat. We didn't need to pee. We kind of talked about maybe catheterizing ourselves and putting a leg bag on because that would make us super efficient. We laughed about it, but we really weren't. Uh, we had these, these, these crazy expectations our whole life was medicine. And of course, this, this arose at a time where there was a full-time spouse at home, which is, is not the case anymore, but some of these um, expectations continue. Uh, it was a time of like abject neglect. You know, we saw our colleagues having substance use problems. We just, we just didn't look, we, we, we didn't look away. There was no such thing as physician health at that time. Um, and it was not a good time. So then we got to about 2010-ish. Mm, so now it's well-being 1.0. Uh, now we're not, not gods, we're, we're heroes. So we need to look after ourselves so that we can do the best job possible for our patients, we're still going to withstand crazy pressures because we're heroes, you know, like our heroes do. Um, and I like to think of this time, it, it was the time of the survey. This was the time where all the surveys came out uh, again and again and again through medical school, residency, faculty to say that we were all unwell. And they kept doing these surveys that just kept saying we were still unwell. Um, and we talked a little bit about work-life balance, and that was kind of like, you know, how we look after ourselves when we're that work person, when I'm physician Mel, and then I was a totally different person outside of work. I was like personal Mel and, and was totally different, and I was trying to balance those two things. So then we go to well-being 2.0. So we go from being gods to heroes. Now we realize, oh my God, we're human. 
We're human, we're super vulnerable. We get all of the same medical conditions everybody else does. We actually need things like sleep and food and all that stuff. And then we started talking about work-life integration so that like you could be the same person at work as you were at home and you didn't have to change. You could integrate who you were and, and that, was, that was the goal. This is also when uh, we realized that there was an ethical and business case for physician health. So in the States, it really resonated because they soon realized that if you had well physicians, they made less errors, there was less lawsuits, they were more productive, more patients going through, more money. So that was an important driver in why physician health is a little bit farther along in the United States because they have this, this business case. In, in Canada, we're gonna have to lean a little bit more on, on the ethical case for it. And this is when it totally became the, the focus on, on systematic, systematic and structural issues that are, were in our environment and, and clear understanding that the problem was the work environment, not weakness in the worker. So what are we going to do? So clearly, uh, leaning into Physician 2.0, the change has to be pervasive and systematic. So one of the big things is faculty development. And the thing that I am leaning into right now at U of A is leadership development, because that is a huge bang for your buck. And it's leadership development at all levels. So like if I could develop the residents, for instance, or they came, maybe I'm even developing them as medical students, but into residents. So if there's a senior resident on the team and he has amazing skills because we've taught them deliberately, he is going to, or she is going to make sure that there is psychological safety. They're going to call out microaggressions on the team. They're going to make sure it's like this lovely culture and everybody's caring for each other and they have each other's backs. It would be amazing. So from that microcosm, we just move to the bigger macrocosms of, you know, divisional leaders, department leaders, those pieces so that they start, you know, knowing how to, to care for the people in their environment, how to call out the people that are not so functional and, and, and really tackle those things and, and have that accountability for the psychological safety. The other thing, too, that as as in my leadership course that's going to replace cardiology block, the giving and receiving of feedback. I mean, we all kind of learned this vicariously, or maybe there was one lecture, but we're still not really great at that. Um, and the other thing uh, for faculty development is imbuing this benefit of the doubt culture, this think ill before evil. And I got that term from David McKnight at Toronto like 20 years ago, and I love it. But, you know, it's it's just, you know, thinking like instead of somebody's bad, it's like what's what's going on for them. And I think a lot of us have seen the Vanderbilt model in terms of, you know, if somebody's not being their usual self and being unprofessional, you sit down and say, hey, what's going on? How can I support you? Because the majority of time there's something going on and that person needs support. It's, it's not that that they're a bad person for sure. The other thing that's funny in medicine is we're often remembered for our worst day. Um, you know, that that one day uh, that uh, Leslie Flynn uh, back in the 1990s, I think it was a Tuesday, I think it was in March, she was really, you know, upset about something and she like slammed the phone down. Like, I totally remember it. I remember that time she did that. Uh, I, I talk about it all the time. I don't, you know, talk about all the times Leslie Flynn was amazing and compassionate and caring for her patients and her colleagues. But again, we have this very weird highlight reel in medicine. The other big thing that has to happen is support of policies and procedures. Even the tone of the policies have to be looked at to say that, you know, are, are they are they supportive? Do, do they imbue well-being? Like, and, and, and looking at those very specific pieces. Uh, you need leadership. So you need folks like me. We all have different names across Canada um, and we need a budget to do it. And then I had this amazing idea that I totally stole from Melanie Yeager uh, about continuous quality improvement cycles. So wouldn't it be cool if there was a director of well-being in every division? So in PEDS, there's a director of well-being. And every year we do this thing where we, we tackle things that are driving us crazy in our environment. So what are the things in our environment that um, are getting in the way of patient care? And what are the things that are eroding our health? And often those two things are the same. So you get everybody in the environment, the nurses, the docs, everybody, and you say, what are the things that... Like, like, what are the rules that you are breaking every day and, and what rules need to change? And so then you, you collate all those and you get a couple of them. And then every 12 to 18 months, you work on those and you have this continuous quality improvement cycle to improve the things that are getting in your way to do your work and affecting your health and your environment. 
That's, that's what I aspire to anyway. And then, of course, we need research and metrics. And metrics are super important to ground our work to make sure we're going in the right direction. And they also help the change management um, because you have to create that sense of urgency. So I think many of you have heard about the Okanagan Charter. If you haven't, the Okanagan Charter is this really cool international uh, movement uh, for health promoting universities and colleges. It's used across the world. Um, it's named the Okanagan Charter in this case because that was the last time the meeting convened and shockingly it was convened in the Okanagan. It used to be the Edmonton Charter when it convened in Edmonton. But it's an amazing charter that Queen signed on to a number of years ago and then your Faculty of Medicine signed on to it specifically last year. And we're trying to put the principles of the Okanagan Charter into practice because they talk about structural and systemic change. So for once in our life in medicine, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to use this as a vehicle for, for national change. So the deans at every single medical school appointed a person that would lead this movement at their school. And then we've been getting together to support each other, to brainstorm and to come up with ideas of how we can support well-being within our, our university um, cultures. The big thing with the, the Okanagan uh, Charter, it has two main calls to action, but the first one, embed health into all aspects of campus culture across administration, operations, and academic mandates. What that really translates into is, number one, looking at policies and procedures, uh, looking at the resources you have. Do you have the resources to do your job? Do you have the resources to support yourself? Coaching, peer support, those pieces, and identify the gaps, look at the redundancies and all of that faculty development, everybody should be supported to be their best selves. And then that just spills over to enjoying your work and enjoying your personal life too. And then the other place is creating these, these inclusive uh, communities and, and really paying attention to some of the things in your environment that um, are not so helpful with that. So I think it's pretty cool. Uh, we've had a few meetings and uh, I really see this, this movement taking hold. So it's complicated, uh, but what is the, the tipping point to action in, in our culture? Because uh, clearly uh, our dismal health outcomes that have been persisting for decades is not enough. So the fact that we are literally dying is not enough to tip the scales into action or our crumbling healthcare system or our cr crumbling primary healthcare uh, currently in Canada. So what is the thing that is gonna really tip the scales? So at U of A, uh, I have found metrics to be super important for two reasons. Number one, I have to find metrics that work to identify the areas that need a little bit more care and attention. And second of all, like I said, I need to light a fire under some folks to, to spark change. And this has been wickedly helpful. So the one thing that I'm privy to is all of our internal and external uh, residency reviews. And so often if you are on intent to withdraw, it's because of learning environment. So I'll go into those areas that have been identified um, and I'll do a climate survey with the group and a, a chat about psychological safety, usually in hidden curriculum. And these are the questions that I like. I totally adapted them from a really cool book called Fix Your Climate. Uh, and the questions are, can you speak up? Are you afraid of reprisal if you do? Is there backbiting, you know, talking about someone behind their back in your environment? Are there other forms of bullying by colleagues? Have you been subjected to microaggressions? Do you feel engaged at work? Are you thinking of leaving, retiring, or changing programs? And do you feel that you're being supported to meet your best potential? I have to say number seven has been gold. So I did a, a big group, um, a division in internal medicine recently. And when I did the climate survey, 50% of their faculty members were thinking of leaving. Uh, I, did I did it with another group, and I found out that 80% of their residents were thinking of transferring out of the program, either out of that particular uh, specialty or just same specialty, different place, because the environment just, just wasn't supportive and, and where they wanted to be. Uh, that's huge. And so I start these conversations, and I'm very specific to say this is the beginning. What now? So usually then it leads to working groups or it leads to a retreat. And then I'm annoying. Uh, I just hang in there and create that sense of accountability to make sure that things are getting better. And, and there's some clear metrics that show that, um, or they're just stuck meeting with me again and again. And that is a form of punishment. Um, I added uh, a bonus question over the last little bit. And so sometimes I'm doing like full grand rounds. Sometimes it's just with residency groups, but this was a residency survey that surprised me. Um, and I, and the, the question is, please pick the issue that's most detrimental to your current level of functioning. I assumed it would be work-life balance. So 
it turns out it's balancing administrative demands. And I think, again, this is the dark side of CBME in terms of the unanticipated workload that it created for both faculty and learners. But the thing that I like about this is this is actionable. We can, you know, create a working group amongst the residents and, and the program and say, how can we make this better? How can how, how can we decrease the clutter in your inbox and, and feeling like there's all the demands on you? The other thing that I've been doing at U of A are these hotspot surveys. So I stole this idea from Fiona Moyer in New Zealand, and she'd been doing them in undergrad groups. And so I use the clerks at U of A as kind of my sentinels to figure out where the hotspots uh, just broadly across uh, U of A. So at the end of every clerkship flight, they're asked four questions. Have you experienced or witnessed harassment, intimidation, bullying, and an inclusive environment? And then there's, it's a Likert scale, and then uh, there's a drop down menu for comments um, if you would like to provide them. Um, and it has turned out to be gold. And it's so good uh, because there's also this accountability piece, right? So, like, I find a hotspot. So then it would be me and the associate dean in undergrad medicine, for instance, we would approach the chair and approach the site directors, um, maybe the, the clerkship director or, or whomever we feel needs to be involved. And then we'll kind of dig in and, and see what's going on. And it's meant to be supportive. So like, what resources do you need? Do you need some faculty development? Like what's going on that this environment is, is, is not doing well and is not thriving? And so it's not about like my dean of professionalism. She looks at the people. I'm looking at the place. Uh, and this has been so sensitive and um, helpful that I'm now rolling it out in dentistry, in grad studies, and in PGME. I have to do it a little bit differently because I need to protect the learners when they're from smaller areas, but um, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, rolls out. This is what my dashboard looks like. So um, you want to be 100% is kind of presented funny. So you want to be 100%. So anything that drifts down uh, below 80 requires attention and requires a, a conversation with leadership. Speaking of leadership, so if I have leaders who are totally um, collaborative and, uh, you know, are, are really attuned to the, the learning environment, they're never surprised when I come to them because they usually know what's going on and they had concerns and then I can help support and and give a little bit more uh, support from the dean as well. But it turns out that leadership is a huge impact on our well being. So, this study that was done by Shanafelt, it was about 3,000 physicians and scientists. Uh, and he deployed his um, learning index, which used to be 12 domains, now it's nine. But he found out that for one point increase in his leadership score, there is a 3.3% decrease in the likelihood of burnout and a 9% increase in satisfaction. And then Lottie Derby repeated the survey in 2019, but with non-physicians. And she had 40,000 people in this cohort, and she found an even bigger uh, impact, an 11% increase in odds of employee satisfaction with that one point increase in leadership score and a 7% decrease in the odds of burnout. Really impressive. So, you know, if you're going to have one big move, uh, leadership development, um, that's going to make a, a huge, huge difference. So there's this really cool module that came out of the American Medical Association. And again, it's from Shanna Felt. And this kind of mirrors what the leadership index is, is measuring. And it's these five uh, leadership behaviors that um, make sense to us. But you know how sometimes you, you need it said to you for it really to hit home? So the first thing is creating these inclusive environments, right, with respect and, and nurturing and psychological safety. Um, and, and for leaders to realize that they need to be accountable for that. Uh, to inform, so like that transparency around communication and everybody gets the same communications, not the ones that are just close to the leader. That inquiry that makes sure that you have like participatory uh, management and um, shared decision-making, consistently soliciting input from those you lead. Uh, developing, uh, it says volumes if you are investing in the people in your neighborhood uh, to be the best that they can be. And then recognizing, and, and this isn't done enough, expressing appreciation and gratitude in authentic ways to those you lead. We have all gone to our annual reviews at some point, whether it was at the residency level or it was at staff level, and we have worked so hard and we are trying to do research and we are working our butts off for our patients and all these things. And you go in for this 30 minute annual review and and like the things sometimes that get highlighted, it's like, 
yeah, Mel, yeah, you're pretty good. You're pre pretty good medical educator. So you got these leadership roles. You know, you had this kind of one bad comment here in, 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 in this review. Can, can, we, can we just talk about that? And it becomes like the highlight reel of your talk. And you just come out feeling totally demoralized. Or maybe the conversation was, oh, you only got that much in grants this year. Huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, you only published that much. Oh, okay. And, and how, sorry, how much clinical care were you doing? So like the importance of that conversation every year cannot be overstated. To have people leave that office feeling appreciated and valued. Yes, some people need uh, some, some hard conversations, but that is not the norm. Most of us are working so hard and it is so important that we know our leaders are aware of that. My other thing is my other soapbox about leadership is that we have to be careful what we say and we have to be able to back it up because the only thing worse than doing nothing about a problem like toxic people in places is to say you're going to do something and then do nothing. So like we, we say that we have zero tolerance for harassment, bullying, intimidation and racism, but, but do we? Because we see some people getting away with it and, and some people aren't getting away with it. And so like, I, I just wanna be like subversive and I, every sign or every document I see that says we have a zero policy, I wanna take out the zero and just put some, because I think that it would be more honest. So I think we have to be very careful about what we say uh, and that it is what we do. So let's talk about some of the easiest wins. So I've talked a lot about leadership development, about changing the conversation at planned reviews developing the skills to identify and intervene with unwell and challenging colleagues. I'm always surprised that, you know, uh, a lot of leaders um, might not have necessarily wanted to be leaders, but they ended up being there and, and, and they're not familiar, for instance, like with the Vanderbilt, you know, schema to, 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 to tackle really um, challenging situations. Uh, leaders sometimes aren't aware that they're supposed to be accountable for psychological safety. And then my thing that I want to do annual leadership reviews with all of our divisional directors and our chairs and debrief those and, and in a supportive way with all of our leaders, identify the gaps, and then again, have those faculty development opportunities to, to support them. The other easiest wins, of course, is cultivating community at work. So these are predictable things. Uh, I actually want to stand up on the first day of medical school and say, uh, you are going to have a patient complaint. You are going to make a mistake and like set our students up for what it's really going to be like. So these are all predictable things, right? College complaints, lawsuits, medical errors, unexpected deaths. So like we need to have a network of people who just naturally respond to individuals who are experiencing these things because, you know, we'll all experience them. Um, and the importance of like having peer support and coaching networks available to us. Um, ensuring inclusive environments. This was my low hanging fruit when I first started in the CWO role. And I was like, what am I doing here? Um, so uh, all gender bathrooms. So the med school at U of A is like one of the newest buildings. It does not have all gender bathrooms. Uh, so that was like a like an eight month project to actually change some names on doors. Um, we say that, you know, we support working moms and yet we don't have spaces for uh, lactation and breast pumping and all those pieces. Um, we need all faith prayer spaces that are accessible um, to, to our learning and workspaces, and we need accessible spaces for all. So at the U of A, um, you couldn't get to the Office of Advocacy and Wellbeing, where we arranged accommodations if you were like a wheelchair user or you had some sort of lower limb difference, because we didn't have powered doors. Like, what does that say? Anyway. Some, th some things that you can dig into. The other thing is I love the statistic. Physicians who spend 20% of their professional effort focused on the dimension of life they find most meaningful are at dramatically lower risk for burnout. So this is important for leaders to know, to make sure that the, the, the people that need to be in their clinic get to be there at least one day a week. For people who love research, that they get to do it 20% of the time. And we have to ask for that and advocate for it too, to keep ourselves well. It turns out if you do that thing that you love more than 20%, it doesn't actually commensurately decrease your risk of burnout. But do what you love at least 20% of the time. What is a setup for failure? Well, number one, critical offices and leadership who don't model this just and trust culture. So if there's bullying going on in the dean's office, it's a tough sell. Um, a lack of tangible action against threats. And like sometimes for leadership, that's tough, right? Because sometimes they're doing something, but it's behind, you know, the veil. And so they're working through a process. But, you know, for confidentiality, you don't know that. Um, so th there's lots of reasons why that might be. Um, if mistakes are not quickly acknowledged, we're going to make mistakes for sure, but just acknowledge them and move on and learn from them. 
um, a lack of recognition that people and money will be required to get this movement started and sustained. And this is my problem, a lack of patience. For people who know me, this is a problem for me. Um, and the thing that I've learned, uh, I told the Dean when I accepted this job that I was gonna make some people uncomfortable. And I have because uh, upending, the status quo, upending the status quo is a little uncomfortable. So we are changing. Uh, our culture when your program or department starts to attract and retain learners, staff, and scientists. Uh, we're changing when search and select committees recognize the institutional values and pick leadership accordingly, because, oh my Lord, it's way easier to pick the right leader who's got all of those health-promoting qualities than change a leader that's there who might not be super insightful to their blind spots. Um, you know, we're changing when we have structures in place to manage challenges, and we actually walk the values that we say that we have. And we know we're changing culture when mistreatment, racism, and disruptive physicians decreases. We're changing uh, when we have this culture where we acknowledge our mistakes and where we can do better. Um, we're changing when our burnout rates decrease and we have more engaged leaders and faculty. Uh, and we have a positive shift of, of quality of life indicators and professional fulfillment of physicians. So we, we've talked about a ton of things here. We talked about the dismal health outcomes of our learners and our clinician, which in turn affects our quality of uh, care that we deliver. We talked about how we've transitioned from being gods to heroes to humans. Um, and it's super clear that the real impact of changing culture and, and being well ourselves and being in these thriver, thriving cultures is identifying the occupational hazards and intervening. Uh, chiefly among them, psychological safety, uh, we need to upskill our leaders to deal with threats and ensure our insights and contributions are valued. Uh, and we have this cool national vehicle now in the Okanagan Charter to, to really achieve these health supporting learning and work environments and really get this movement going. And we also talked about how critical metrics are to identify areas requiring support and, and creating that sense of urgency and that why for change. And finally, we identified uh, some low hanging fruit uh, to tackle and some strategies for this continuous quality improvement uh, cycles. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, we can do this uh, in our lifetimes because uh, we simply can't continue on our current course and waiting for the next generation to fix our issues is simply not defensible. So in summary, we need to identify and uh, weed out the occupational hazards in our work and learning environments, and then we can reclaim the meaning, creativity, and engagement in our work because the issue isn't the worker, it's the work environment. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mel. That was amazing. Um, and like you, I'm not very patient. And <laughs> but also like you, I, I have eternal optimism that we will see it improve in our lifetime. Um, even if that's getting shorter by the day. <laughs> So I'd love to open it up, um, either put uh, questions or comments in the chat or raise your hand. Um, oh, everybody was, many were able to change their Savula tag, um, but, uh, or just raise your hands or just unclick your mute button and ask a question. Um, it's pretty well open. I might start then while people are thinking and writing things. When you go into a hot spot and you find a very um, toxic area, what do you think is the most common cause of that? Like there's a reason why it's a nasty area. Is it, and it's, and the, as you said, it's usually not the people, they're nice people, but is it that their workload is just too high? Is it that their administrative burden is overwhelming? Is it their, um, what what do you or is it just different for every different group? It is pretty different. That's what's kind of fun with this work because you realize, and you and I have talked about this, like when you're when you're looking at solutions, one size doesn't fit all because every different area has their unique struggles. Um, in a lot of these places, the number one thing I see is that these issues have been festering for a very long time, and there's been a lack of collegiality, and it's been festering for all for all lots of good reasons, like you say, like in a crazy workload and and those pieces. But a lot of times, it does get back to leadership, you know, like leadership that that was willing to tackle some of these these hard problems and to address them, or even just to acknowledge them. Uh, we had a chair who stood up and say, 
we have racism here. And the fact that they just acknowledged it was huge. Like I had folks replying to me, like who were super emotional saying just the fact that we acknowledged that, that this is going on, even though we didn't have, you know, uh, a, a clear intervention was huge. So, you know, a lot of these problems have been going on for a long time and they festered and certain personalities um, have been allowed to thrive in, in some areas. And we all, we all know some of those personalities because they have really problematic behavior. And then what happens to them? They get promoted. So, you know, yeah. uh, our systems are funny. So there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, what effect do you see arising from the added pressure of the present postmodern deconstructive, deconstructivist neo-Marxist zeitgeist on the continued atomization, alienation, um, and commodification of clinicians who are ultimately treated as Wow, uh, you're way smarter than me. I'm just trying to keep up with the words. Um, Kantian means <laughs> in the healthcare system. How do we encourage cultures of dignity um, as opposed to victimhood? What role does Taleb's anti-fragility play in promoting agency? Can you read this too, Mel? In the chat? I, I, I just love your voice. I was just listening to you. <laughs> and resilience of the individuals in complex adaptive healthcare systems. Would a humanistic com communitarian approach yield a better overall social milieu in medicine? Okay, that's a big question. It's great. It's a, long, it's a big question. So uh, I agree, uh, humanism is huge. Uh, this whole idea of admitting our vulnerabilities and being honest with each other and not being so performative as we've been raised to be in medicine, like saying like, it looks fine on the outside and we are crumbling on the inside. Like, sure, we can just keep adding these pressures. We, we totally can't. And, and we have to, to, to break down some of those barriers and this, this performative thing that we've been doing. The other thing that you bring up, it made me remind me of what happened in the United States with the EMR. So there's, there's good and bad to the EMR for sure. We just have rolled out a province-wide EMR in Alberta. So like I said, I could talk lots about it. But in the States, it's become a metric for, for performance. Like with, they use their, their EPIC system to see like, did, did Melanie start that case on time? Okay, she, she gets, oh, she's late. Okay, that's a, that's a negative. You're, you're getting docked some money there. Oh, you started early. Oh, you, oh, you get a bonus. Uh, how many hours did you spend on your EMR? How many patients did you take to the OR? Like all of those pieces have just become so negative because we're being measured like a cog in the wheel and, and not how we thought medicine was supposed to be this compassionate, humanistic profession where, you know, we were, we were supposed to be curious and about relationships and all those pieces. Um, so I think we, we should learn from our American colleagues because the EMR has been really misused um, in a lot of those settings that just translate into, you know, performance metrics. It is tough when there's so many performance metrics that a measure just are, as Christine Sinsky says, our production line crap, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It just drains your life out of you when, um, when our, when we're measured on that. None of our solution shop, our problem solving abilities. It all comes down to those base um, metrics. There's another question. Um, are there, and this is staying anonymous. Are there tricks? or approaches that one can take when you want to make big changes, but you're at the bottom of the hierarchy? When you have yes. little, very little control or say. Well, you have little control or say, and there is real fear of retribution, right? Going forward. So that's a real thing. That's when you have to have someone like me in your environment or a well-being director, or somebody who's in a different place that you can meet with and hatch a plan. And, and find some like-minded um, uh, individuals. There's this really cool woman who came to U of A. Her name is Carla McLaren, and she does a lot of work around empathy. And we were talking about like having, you know, these hard conversations. And she talked about, you know, sometimes you just need a little anarchy to get around rigid structures. So I feel like when you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, you got to find people who are a little bit higher in the food chain, who are, who are like-minded. They can bring some of these solutions or that they can at least shield you. Um, you have to balance that with like acknowledging the contribution of the person who brought it to you. I feel like I got um, fully promoted in pediatrics, exploiting the talents of medical students and residents. 
that is how I've built my career, but I feel at least I'm honest about it. Yeah, that's a great answer. Any other um, any other questions or or comments? The uh, the EMR will be interesting. Um, John Drover is on the call, or at least he was. He is leading our new introduction for our EMR, which will be starting in a year. So I think we're all um, approaching that with a bit of anxiety. Um, Leslie. Thanks. I, I want to thank you, Mel Lewis, for a, such a fa fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Um, I, I wondered about your role as Chief Wellness Officer. Um, we have a fantastic lead, our Mel, Dr. Yeager, um, who is our physician wellness lead, but you're the only Chief Wellness Officer in the country. And I wondered what you thought about that role and its impact and just, just could you speak to that a little bit for us? So I was very specific about that title when um, this job kind of came around. It had a different title. I like it because it has a very clear job description and mandate in the literature. So I could totally lean into that about what it is and what it isn't. And I really like the role because I uh, look after everybody in the U of A neighborhood. So I look after learners, administrators, and the faculty members. Um, it's 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 looking at systemic and structural issues that are like pinching our health and, and getting in the way of us doing the work that we want to do. So I thought it was really important to have that. It's interesting because um, there is some sensitivities around using the word chief in a, in a role description right now. And so I'm not really sure what to do with that. And I've kind of clung to it only because it's a distinctive role that's well known and well described. And so I, I really needed that. I also liked it in the organizational structure. So I report to the Dean. And so it's just a little bit cleaner where I am in the organization. And then I spend a ton of time like with my EDI Dean and my professionalism Dean and my faculty affairs Dean and my learner affairs Deans and all of those folks. And then, I mean, the whole goal is to have this big health promoting learning and work committee. Um, it's just sometimes hard as you know, when there's so many players and having an unwieldy committee to make it functional. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Alenia, Alenia is a deputy chair of family medicine. Just <laughs> Hi, um, thanks so much, um, Mal. I was really interested in your um, talk and it was really inspiring. Um, I was particularly interested in the conversation about leadership and the investment in leadership and how that is directly tied to wellness in many ways and, and how you were talking about that. And, um, one of the initiatives we did in our department um, that didn't go to all of our sites because we're a distributed department, but for our Kingston and Belleville areas was we brought Crucial Conversations, um, the PLI course. We just ran our last session yesterday and today and Dr. Jillian Kernahan led it. And um, part of the reason we did that was a, in an effort to be intentional about shifting culture to give um, all of our staff, so it wasn't just our physicians, it was all of our staff in our department, so nurses, clerical, physicians, the tools um, to help have some of those difficult conversations that are perhaps leaving us stuck um, in certain areas in our department across our, our pillars, which is education, research, and clinical. So I'm excited to see where that's going to go, um, but it was a massive fiscal investment. Like I think it cost our department $70,000. So in an era of, you know, and we were able to do that because of money we didn't spend in the pandemic on things like lunches at Grand Rounds and things like that. But in an era where we have ongoing fiscal pressures, how do we balance the investment actually that it takes to actually invest in ongoing leadership training, not just for physicians, but everybody in our organizations to give us the tools that we need to actually be able to work together more collaboratively and, and have some of those difficult conversations that we actually need to build um, relationships and have those safe spaces um, to be able to have those difficult but so meaningful and so important conversations that can move us forward. Ali, that's just an amazing conversation because it's all about psychological safety and creating that and being able to have the right words like, 
what's going on between us right now, Alina? You seem like super emotional. Like what, what's going on? And to have to enter into those really, you know, some sometimes treacherous conversations in a way that, that comes at it with curiosity that, again, we weren't taught this in medical school. But the problem is, as you say, it's money. And it's expensive to get like the, like uh, Dare to Lead is another amazing course, but it's super expensive because Brene Brown is amazing. And uh, those pieces. So I'm trying to assemble like an in-house team. So like if I do the leadership index for PDs and for everybody in my neighborhood, I need this cadre of coaches. And there's a lot of people who have amazing coaching backgrounds that they're formally trained to debrief it with the leaders. And then again, on the other end, now I've got to develop the faculty development resources and the modules to, to fix the things that are revealed on that leadership index that they need supports with. But in that way, then we can have this kind of continuous way of doing things. And it happens every year and I have a budget for it it's not nearly as expensive as crucial conversations because we've run into the same thing it's a great course but it's just wicked expensive and then you target it for this group and then there's all these new people who never got it in your in your midst so I, I you, ha you have to develop those resources I think in-house in, in whatever way you can um and and I I've really leaned into the folks in my environment who are amazing coaches to to help coach the leaders once we do those inventories to to support them and you know we've all had those um assessments where you just like you look at the results and you're like oh I feel terrible about myself uh this is awful so like you have to do it in the right way and then you have to make it really constructive coming out of it but yeah money's always a barrier for sure I think that's a great point about using the team because that was part of what um, Dr. Kernahan said that when they did it at St. Joe's in London and eventually like at, at the facility she was initially the VP medicine and the CEO of, they trained all their senior leaders to actually teach it. And it was a part of the way to actually show everybody that they were willing to walk that walk as well. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a cool idea is that maybe we should be embedding, you know, training the trainers kind of thing within our senior leaders yeah you got to build the machinery and, and you know what it wouldn't be that expensive but it's just assembling the right team and then figuring what those costs are and then and then it's nowhere near what it would cost for crucial conversations or other courses um and Thank you. thanks alenia oh probably last question it's 10 after but um uh, Mel, oh, that was an excellent talk. We enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Except for the part about uh, canceling cardiology. Uh, <laughs> now, Mel, for the ten percent that the institution cannot change and that we we are responsible ourselves, uh, how do you suggest we go about teaching our trainees to uh, you know to work on those ten percent? Because the reality is they're going to end up working in similar environments and you know, struggle with the same things that this committee and the group work with. So what is it that we can, uh, you know, sometimes I hesitate, you know, I'm working on my own wellness and, you know, now I'm going to have to teach it too. And uh, what's your advice on that matter with the students and the residents? Uh, so I've got a couple ideas from being in learner affairs for 11 years and working with residents and grad students and, and med students. Uh, I think uh, you have to embed your well-being curricula, but you have to do it in a way that's authentic. Nobody wants to go to a didactic lecture like this on well-being. Like you have to have authentic voices, like people who are a little bit above a near peer to really provide that information about why it's important. And it needs to get embedded into the curriculum from day one. Like I, I really do want to come and say, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to be imperfect. And then the other thing that I'm involved with is this performance mental skills project that is a curriculum that that hopefully the goal is to unroll it in undergrad and postgrad especially. But it's um, the idea and it comes from sports psychology that we just assume we're going to have a bad event. We will have a bad event. You're going to have a bad patient outcome. You're going to make a medical error. You're going to get sued. And instead of just like sitting in the mess, it's a way to say, OK, this is we expected this to happen. And these are the skills that you need to to come out of it. So that, you know, you're going to reframe, re-goal set, all of those pieces. And it's a, you know, a, a, a process that we were never taught because it feels awful. Like it feels awful when we've had a bad patient outcome and, and we've made an error, but like, then how do you dig out of it in a really deliberate way? So I think if we can teach those things and ground them in curricula and teach them in the right way with the right technique, I think that that will really help that 10%. It's self-compassion and vulnerability. It's all those pieces, right? That we just never talked about when we went to med school. Thank you very much.
And uh, I think we should probably call it there. So thank you so much, Mel. That was amazing. Um, and as a fellow Tate Shanafelt fangirl, um, I will <laughs> um, I will end by saying, I think we have the 80% is structural, but as Tate says, it's still ours to fix. We cannot wash our hands of it. We can't have this learned helplessness. We cannot be victims. That 80% of this toxic environment sludge in which we live is ours to fix. No one else's. Love it. Well I said. <laughs> so thank you so much for helping us figure out how to fix it because it is ours. <laughs> Friends. Thank you again. Take care.